This is the second Sunday of Easter. I think you're probably aware that the Easter season continues on for another magical 40 days. So that, again, that number 40. And uh, the scriptures tell us that Jesus was on earth making his appearances for 40 days before his ascension uh, at the end of that period of time. So for the next several weeks, we will be reading scriptures and talking a little bit about what does this mean that Jesus has been raised? So for this Sunday, we're going to read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and verses 13 uh, through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Clopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all the prophets, all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord had risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when Sue and I uh, moved to Virginia, uh, we were surrounded by the Civil War. That's not a euphemism for the fact that we were arguing a lot, no. (laughs) We were surrounded by the real Civil War. One could hardly live there without becoming familiar with the basic understanding of this uh, tense period of American history. Just beyond our backyard, uh, we don't have fences there, but just past our backyard line in our neighborhood was a protected Civil War battlefield. And they were everywhere, by the way, with trenches that had survived over these 150 years. Today, April 12th, marks the day in 1861 when the first shots were fired on Fort Sumter, marking the beginning of the Civil War, or as the South referred to it, the War of Northern Aggression. The Civil War was a national war. 
But if you look closely, it was acted out in history as the battle over Virginia. The capital of the North, the Union Army, was Washington, D.C. The Confederate capital was Richmond, about 100 miles south, and right in between lay Fredericksburg, where we lived. Fredericksburg, Virginia, and <clears throat> Spotsylvania County were the soil upon which many of these battles at this day and this time took place. Only one state had more than 30 battles. That was Tennessee. They had 38 battles. Most had less than 10. Virginia had over 120 battles on its soil through these four years, and most of the major ones. We didn't know all this when we moved there. We knew very little about the Civil War other than it happened a long time ago. Um, but you could hardly drive along the road without seeing some marker remembering a significant event in the Civil War. In fact, the, the, the Presbyterian church that we attended downtown was uh, a hospital uh, for soldiers that was started by Clara Barton, who would later found the American Red Cross. Uh, this past Thursday, April 9th, marked the 150th anniversary of the surrender of Robert E. Lee to General Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia, 150 years ago, almost exactly four years after the war began. Five days later, Lincoln would be assassinated in Washington, D.C. The Appomattox Courthouse is uh, now one of the many national parks that preserve the memory of this period of history. So as we move towards April the 9th, Richmond falls to the Union Army on April the 3rd. Lee's 30,000 troops are on the run. They're running west, chased by Grant, 65,000 troops. Finally, they catch up to him about 100 miles, like I said, to the west and prevent him from returning to, Jer to, uh, to Richmond, Jerusalem. They probably, <laughs> they probably would have liked to have been in Jerusalem at that moment. So they have him surrounded, and Lee has nowhere to run. Finally, General Lee surrenders in order to spare the lives of his troops. The meeting between the two leaders lasts only 90 minutes in this small home there in Appomattox as they work out the terms of surrender. All the soldiers would surrender their artillery and their public property, but they would be allowed to go home with their horses and with their sidearms. Once the terms were agreed upon and signed by General Lee, one of the uni uh, Union officers in the room wrote these words. At a little, a little before 4 o'clock on April 9th, General Lee shook hands with General Grant, bowed to the other officers, and with Colonel Mar Marshall left the room. One after another we followed and passed out to the porch. Lee signaled to his orderly to bring up his horse, and while the animal was being bridled, the general stood on the lowest step and gazed sadly in the direction of the valley beyond where his army lay. Union officers in the yard rose respectfully at his approach. All appreciated the sadness that overwhelmed him. Once mounted, General Grant now stepped down from the porch and moved toward him, saluted him by raising his hat, he was followed in this by an act of courtesy by all our officers present. Lee raised his hat respectfully in return and rode off to break the sad news to the brave fellows whom he had so long commanded. It is said that when Lee addressed his troops discussing his surrender, he could barely speak, but told his troops, go home and become good citizens. Union troops began to fire their rifles in the air as, as, as uh, celebrations of triumph, and Grant, Grant ordered it to be stopped. He told them, stop firing, stop the shouting. They are your countrymen. All 30,000 troops filed by and laid down their artillery and other public property, and after four years of fighting, they're allowed to go home. Eyewitnesses to the event said no one spoke. They just all rode silently away. When I read our text this morning, these two travelers headed to Emmaus, I picture the same kind of scene. Emmaus is their home. 
Emmaus is the place that they go when all that they had lived for the, for the past three years had come to an end. And so they silently go home. They're sad about the death of a dream. After all the hopes that they had for what Jesus would do and what Jesus would bring. The text just says when Jesus walks up to them, they stand still and were sad. Peterson translates it this way. They were long faced like they had just lost their best friend. Verse 21, they say to him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We thought that Jesus would rescue us, but evidently we were wrong. He is crucified, the movement comes to an end, and so just like the Confederate soldiers, they silently lay down their arms and go home. So many dreams are like that. So many things that begin with good intentions or hopeful ideas or uh, positive you know, energy end up ending. They do. And then this. <laughs> I'm sure that we've all experienced this in our lifetime. Jesus goes and finds them. Isn't that a great picture? Just that. Jesus goes and finds them. And in those times when our dreams don't work as planned, when we're dejected or feeling hopeless, Jesus comes to look for us. He doesn't just sit in the church and wait for us to come back to him or sit somewhere off in a high mountain drumming his fingers, waiting for you to get your act together. He comes and looks for us. Remember what the young man dressed in white from last week's story? Remember what he says to the three women? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Remember that? People have made a, you know, all sorts of conjectures as to you know, what does that mean. I think he's telling them, don't forget Peter. He's, he's not feeling very well right now. He's feeling pretty bad. He denied me three times and... Go tell him that you saw me, and I'll be showing up for him too. Tell him I asked about him. Tell him I asked about him. Ever go through a period of your life when you're not sure anybody asks about you? <laughs> anybody wonders about you? How nice it is to be asked about. The Emmaus, the Emmaus story is a, uh, a resurrection story. But, but not, because, not because the resurrection Jesus shows up. He does show up. But that's not why it's a resurrection story. We think that's why at first. But it's not really why it's a resurrection story. It's a resurrection story because of what happens inside these two disciples after this experience. That's why it's a resurrection story. And in fact, without that happening inside the two disciples, I'm not sure it is a, uh, a resurrection story. It's just sort of academic. In, their very, in that very hour, at their point of greatest sadness, greatest dejection, the decision to leave Jerusalem and, and go home, in that moment, Jesus shows up and their hearts come alive again. Their hearts, a little spark of possibility ignites. Oh, that's a great moment. You know, when, in your darkest place, when, 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 when all of a sudden a spark of possibility that, that maybe all is not lost. And we know this because look at what they do in your text. Immediately, they just get home, and immediately it, it says they get up to go back to Jerusalem. Seven, seven miles walk, seven mile walk, so this is not, you know, that easy. They just go back. Only hours before, they leave Jerusalem in despair, and now their hope is revived, and they return with a story. 
The dream wasn't going to work out quite as expected, but the dream was not dead. That's what they realized. That's what they heard Jesus explain. Yeah, I know you thought it was going to turn out this way, but, you know, there's another way to look at it. There's another way to think about it. Something is next, and in their hearts, resurrection happens. So Jesus shows up to nudge them back to Jerusalem. He doesn't want them hanging out in Emmaus. He wants them back at the community. Maybe that's why Jesus just gives this little, little appearance. You know, nothing, nothing where they're not going to build any altars there in the home at Emmaus. He wants them back in Jerusalem. Eugene Peterson used to say, there is no such thing as a private Christian. I like that. No such thing. No way to follow Jesus alone is really what Peterson was, was driving at. No way to get really the intent of what it means to be a follower of Jesus by yourself. There is no category for that in the Bible. Christian is a relational term. The church is a community. It is, it is who we are when we're together. That's the point. When we're with one another. It represents our way of celebrating the way we see the world. It's a way of celebrating these things that Jesus preached and stood for. It's a way of standing for hope. And we, we stand for hope with people and with some people who can't stand for hope on their own. We're invited to see the world through the eyes of resurrection hope. And when he broke the bread at the table, they recognized him. In that act of community remembrance, they recognized that Jesus was with them. Maybe, and I think it's possibly true, that one of the reasons the church started celebrating the Last Supper regularly when they met was because of this story. When they came back and told the story, how it was in the breaking of the bread that they saw Jesus, probably that's where this Last Supper celebration, regular celebration of the Last Supper started. The sense that Jesus shows up in community. Eat this, drink this in remembrance of me. We are a community that promises to love one another as Jesus loved us. We carry on his message because we believe he is alive in us and in the world. It's what we represent. When we believe it strongly and when we're barely hanging on to it, it's what we represent together as a community. It doesn't rest on anyone's good enough faith. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. It rests on the strength of the community. That was the beauty of what Jesus came to establish. His, the body of Christ on earth, made up of many members. We don't live by our individual visions but on the vision of the community, gathered together, we are the resurrected body of Christ in the world. So as Sue mentioned, tomorrow our daughter Dory is giving birth to our third grandbaby. And uh, we're very excited. We've been waiting so long. Nine months seems like a long time. I'm sure it seems longer for Dory, but it's, it's really long for grandparents. This new life is coming into the world. We've been thinking about Ethan during this time. Little Ethan who is totally confused about what's happening, but he knows something's up. We've all been pointing out to him that baby sister will be out soon. She's in there, but baby sister will be out soon. So every once in a while when he hears a loud noise, he'll come running out into the living room and shout, She's out! She's out! No, she's not out yet. Very soon. Very confusing at two and a half years old. A lot will change for Ethan in these next few years. Having a baby sister won't be exactly as he might expect. 
if he expects anything. He may not like some of it. She will take a certain amount of attention away from him. He will no longer be the only child. One of the many rude awakenings in life. He will need to adjust, make room in his head for another member of the family. He will still be the center of attention. He will just not be the only center of attention. Huh? God brings us into community. God births us as a church. God brings us alive together, together in community to deliver us from being the only center of attention. Deliver us. So we can know that we're loved, but that we're not the only ones loved. So that we can know that others are loved also. I used to explain to our children when they were younger, because they all wanted to be the favorite, and um, it didn't work to take them aside and tell each of them that they were our favorite, because <laughs> they do talk to one another occasionally. But I think we finally ended up telling them that they don't have just a piece of our heart, but when each of them were born, God created a new heart in us for them. Each one has our whole heart. I think this is what God says to us. You don't have a little piece of God's heart. You have his whole heart. And in times of struggle or difficulty, when you have a hard time with disappointment or whatever you go through, to know God comes looking for you so that you can know that his heart beats for you. And that community of love is the community that God designed to change the world. It's very simple. Sometimes doesn't feel powerful enough. But that's his plan. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.